It wasn't the flies, nor the incessant chattering of the forest that would not let me sleep that night, nor the little orangutans who lay all over me, their bodies hot and sticky. Hope and dread kept me awake, hope that Una might somehow be coming to our rescue, and dread of what would happen to us the next day if she did not. I couldn't help wondering who this man was that Kaya had spoken of, this Mr Anthony from Jakarta who seemed to have the power of life and death over everyone in this place, including the orangutans, including myself. I thought of escape too, even though I knew it was quite impossible. The cage was made of wood, but strongly made and well padlocked. The more I thought about everything, the more anxious I became, and the more I came to believe that unless I could find some way of escaping that night, unless Una came for me, then the next day I might very well be sold into some kind of slavery. In the end, to stop myself thinking about such things, to stop the panic rising inside me, I began to say the tiger poem, out loud this time, but softly because I didn't want to wake the orangutans. I recited it again and again. And then I decided to hum to myself all the songs I could remember, one after another. All the George Formby songs we used to sing back home with Dad strumming away on his ukulele, Chinese laundry blues, and I'm leaning on a lamppost at the corner of the street in case a certain little lady comes by. Oh me, oh my. And then, I've no idea why, I found myself humming the Chelsea song. Blue is the colour, football is the game. The one dad and I would stand up and sing, along with 40,000 others at Stamford Bridge at the end of every match. It was during one of these familiar tunes that I must have drifted off to sleep at last. I was awoken by the sound of an engine and the splash and crunch of a car coming down the track. I propped myself up on my elbows, but only as far as I could without disturbing the still slumbering orangutans, and saw a huge black 4 by 4 with darkened windows pulling up outside the largest of the shacks. I'd noticed it the evening before. It was the only one that looked anything like a proper house, with proper glass windows, a veranda and a low wooden fence all round. And there'd been a rocking chair out on the veranda right by the front door. I remember thinking that that seemed on, <laughs> incongru incongruously domestic in this sprawling mess of a place. One of the workers was hurrying barefoot past the cage now to open the car door, and there were a couple of others frantically rolling out a length of matting from the car to the steps of the veranda. Not wanting to be noticed, I shrank back in the cage and lay down again. All I could see now were the doors of the car, its huge tyres covered with dirt and a lot of mud-splattered legs running past me. The man who stepped out onto the matting had highly polished shoes and white trousers with immaculate creases. But then he stopped, turning round and came straight back towards me. He was carrying a shiny black stick. His fingers were covered in huge gold rings, at least one on every finger. Suddenly, his face was there right in front of me, pale, puffed up and sweaty with small, shining eyes, venomous eyes. So there you are, he began. He spoke in kind of a drawl. My little monkey boy, they told me about. Sit up, monkey boy. Let's have a look at you. He spoke English, but his accent was strange. I couldn't think where it came from. All I knew was that this had to be the Mr. Anthony from Jakarta that Kaya had told me about. This had to be the man who was God here. He mopped his neck with his handkerchief. Do you know what you are, monkey boy? You're a flaming nuisance. That's what you are, a flaming nuisance. A lousy spanner in the works. You know something? I don't like people who cause me problems. Best thing to do with a problem is to get rid of it, I reckon. So maybe I'll put a bullet in your head and throw you in a hole out there somewhere in the jungle. Problem solved. But then, maybe... Maybe there's a way to make a dollar or two on you first. I can always kill you later, can't I? I'll have breakfast and think about it. He stood up. Bring Monkey Boy up to the house. But I want the little beggar washed down, good and proper first. He stinks to high heaven. As Mr. Anthony walked away through the cat crowd, Kaya among them, I noticed they all lowered their eyes and bowed as he passed them by. Now where's this lousy tiger, he was saying. Show me. I want to see the tiger. He'd better be a good one. He was escorted on all sides by a phalanx of bodyguards, all dressed in the same shiny black suits, every one of them carrying a rifle. I was expecting they'd come back for me any moment, but it seemed like hours later, hours during which I tried all I could to banish the fears inside me. I tried to think of home, of mum and dad, of the farm, tried to see everyone and everything clear in my head, 
try to imagine I was there with them, with grandpa on his tractor, with dad going to the football. If I was going to die, then I wanted th these to be my last living thoughts. I had my eyes closed and was trying to stay deep in my thoughts when I heard them coming for me. Strong arms hauled me out, holding me fast by the elbows on either side. The little orangutans clung on tight to me wherever they could as the men frog marched me away. Terrified though I was, it felt good to be upright again and moving, not cooped up. A crowd was following us, wild with excitement, jeering and whooping, more and more of them all the time. I could see ahead of me now what they had in store for us. One of the hunters, the one with the red bandana again, was standing there beside the cookhouse, ready with a hose pipe, beckoning them to bring us closer. The crowd was all around us, encircling us. I wasn't that worried when they first turned on the hose pipe. It looked harmless enough. In a way, I was even looking forward to it. It was going to be humiliating, being hosed down like this in public, but at least it would be cooling, refreshing. Then I saw there was a smile on the hunter's face, and I remember wondering why he was smiling. I realised what was going to happen too late. The jet of water hit me full in the chest with terrific force, sending me reeling back across the circle. I bent myself double, cradling the orangutans close to me, turning my back on the water, protecting them and me as best as I could. But there was no escape for them or me, however much I tried to run away from it, to dodge or duck or run. There was nowhere to run to. In the end, there was only one thing I could do. I dropped to my knees and cowered there, using my body to shield the screeching orangutans from the full blast of water. The singing torture seemed to go on forever, pummeling every part of me, all to the raucous delight of the crowd, until at last, mercifully, there was an end to it. I was dragged by, to my feet, determined not to cry, not to betray any sign of fear. I faced down my grinning tormentor, pursing my lips, clenching my teeth to hold back the sobs that were rising inside me. Hysterical in their pain and fear, the little orangutans squealed pain pitifully. I did what I could to comfort them, whispering to them all the while as I was led away, but they were beyond consoling. Dressed in an immaculate white suit, Mr Anthony sat there in his chair, waiting for me at the top of the veranda steps, his dark glasses glinting in the sun. At his feet lay the skin of the tiger. My tiger. Una's tiger.